Well, I want to start my talk about, talk about discussing diarrhea. As we go and we think about sexy diseases, which is the least sexy you can think about? Diarrhea. Last thing you want is somebody missed work today and uh, we're around the cooler talking. Yeah, why the person miss? It's having really big diarrhea. So, you know, send our prayers. Uh, and yet, Diarrhea is something that kills one in nine children worldwide. It's the second killer of children under the age of five. As we talked earlier today about thinking about the life of our children, thinking about the mortality of our children, guess what? There are a lot of parents in developing nations, especially in Africa, right now at this point that are thinking that their child might die of diarrhea. Those are... 2,195 children a day that die of diarrhea. To put that in perspective, those are 32 school buses full of children are dying. So those parents in developing nations are thinking today, within the next 40 seconds, my child might be a statistic. So that puts that in perspective. And as we think about it, as we think about the fact that, uh, you know, diarrhea, I mean, and she keeps talking about diarrhea, isn't that disgusting? Um, it's incredibly preventable. 88% of the cases in the world of diarrhea come from waterborne pathogens, waterborne viruses. So, what do we have to do? We have to clean our streams. We have to look at children that are bathing, not even just drinking, they're bathing, they're playing in these waters where people are defecating, throwing trash, just polluting in general. But you know, here we're in a developed nation. Do we have diarrhea that comes from drinking the water? Not really. We live in a world, we talked about rights before one of the speakers talked about rights. We consider in the United States water to be safe and abundant water. Let's clarify that. Safe and abundant water to be our God-given right. Preferably free, preferably in large amounts. So we see this child on, a, on an ad, on a commercial, and we say, I'm going to help her. I'm going to send my dollar. And yeah, that one dollar does help. Uh, we're going to send the dollar, that one dollar, to Africa. It's going to help them. It's going to help with sanitation. It's going to help with vaccinations. It's going to help with cleaning the water. It's going to help with villages kind of getting together, education about not to drink the water, not to play in the water. And that way I can sleep well at night, and I can use my water as I want. And I can use it because it's mine, because it's fun, because it's my God-given right to use water. So I will go ahead and I will brush my teeth with the water running while I have my bathtub going because I refuse to take a bath in anything less than 98.6 degrees because it's my God-given right to a lukewarm bath every day. And even if it takes me five minutes to get the water to that temperature. And let's not forget about my lawn. My lawn is my status, right? Within my neighborhood, my lawn shows my status. It shows to my neighbors that I have lawn. <laughs> I have lawn. I have this beautiful lawn. It's green. It's perfect. So I am going to water it day and night in the rain if I have to. I'm going to also add a lot of fertilizers to this water to make sure that my water looks beautiful. Because water is, again, my God-given right. And I can use it as I want all the time. I don't have to think about it. I can waste it. I can do anything I want. It's safe. It's fruit. It should be close to nothing in this country. and should be abundant. And then one day came, last year, August 2nd, we woke up. I woke up around 6 in the morning. I was getting ready to go for a run. I was training for the New York Marathon, and I'm making my Gatorade, and I went and I got water out of the tap. I drink tap water because in this country it is safe. Um, got the water out of the tap, look at my email, do not drink the water. But then things got interesting. It said do not touch the water. Do not boil the water, right? We're used to, there's a pathogen in the water, boil the water, water's fine. Now I can go and drink it. All I have to do is boil it. I'm good. Well, it said, do not boil the water. 
do not touch the water. That was also another interesting one, wasn't it? So all of a sudden, we found out that uh, water was really not as we had thought. Nobody woke up that day thinking, even remotely in this city or even in the greater area of thinking that there's a chance that, my, that I might wake up in the morning and not have fresh drinking water clean at, I mean, at a very large amount. So we found ourselves in lines for water just like in those developing nations that we talked about. And that's because of stuff that we've done. We polluted the water. We polluted the water by one, by liking those green lawns. I keep going back to the green lawn. Um, by liking our lawns, by adding the fertilizers. We added so many fertilizers that we caused algae uh, in Lake Erie uh, to start growing really in leaps and bonds. It could be seen from space. And let's make a note that the Great Lakes, largest source of fresh drinking water in the world, right here in our backyard, and we're polluting it. So that's also a little wake-up call. But then we're not alone. This year comes around, and we see that the EPA spilled 3 million gallons. OK, one gallon. Now think of 3 million of them. Those are, that's a heck of a lot in Colorado. Mining spill, lots of heavy metals, toxins, going right straight into that water, going into rivers. These rivers are now going to a number of states. And that water is no longer drinkable. It's no longer safe. It can be changing the habitat. Depending, there's a, a good chance that there's a lot of mercury in the water. So again, you can't touch it. There it goes. No, no longer any good for recreation. And then if we keep going west, we reach California. And California is dying of thirst. We don't talk that much here. We're far. We're pretty far away from California. Plus, you know, Californians, they have that, uh, that thought that there's nothing in between LA and New York. And we are in the in-between here. So we're really in the like wastelands. But if we think about what they're going through, they're suffering. They don't have any water. They're going through the largest, the biggest drought in memory. So they don't have water. So if we look back, just 20 years ago, we had water in this country. We were in a water plant for all of these. Let's use water. Let's just keep dumping stuff into Lake Erie. The water will come back clean. I have no worries. Well, 10 years from now, we're no longer going to be there. We are going to live in a country that has issues with water scarcity. So what I am here to tell you is that we have to look for other alternatives. We no longer can look at lakes and rivers and the bodies of waters that we do. We have to look at sustainable sources of water, the oceans. We live in a blue planet. There's water everywhere. We have to treat the oceans. And then sewage, wastewater. And you're just thinking, to yourself, wait a minute. She started out talking about people dying of diarrhea, and now she's telling me to go drink wastewater? What is she, some kind of nut? Does she have some issue that she says one thing and about 10 minutes later she says another? Now, we're going to clean this water. And in my long view, what I am going to tell you is that the only thing that limits us is our imagination. To treat this water, we make filters now. We can make filters. We will make the perfect filter. And the perfect filter will take inspiration from natural systems. We have to start looking at the world around us and not separate. No longer we should separate nature from the artificial world. We have to look at nature and say, you work perfectly, so I am going to take inspiration from you into an artificial world so that I can make systems, so that I can make water treatment resemble how nature perfectly treats water. And of these, here, of all of these examples, I'm going to take a couple of them that I specifically work on that talks about self-cleaning filters and talks about uh, biological pores on filters. So first, let's talk about this idea of a filter that can self-clean. Talking about filtering wastewater here, right? So how fast would that, that filter be really nasty and unusable? Pretty darn fast. So if we can make a filter that can clean itself, that would be perfect. It would be cleaning itself, it would be cycling itself, and eventually, you know, it would last for a very long period of time, and there would not be a problem. And so we go to nature, 
and we look at inspiration. We look at the cactus plant. What, where does cactus live? In what, places that have very, very, very little water, right? And that cactus, once it sees water, it will take in through its cell every single last drop it can because it needs it to survive. And then if we look on the other spectrum and we look at the lotus leaf, the lotus leaf hates water so much that a drop of water will be perfect on top of that lotus leaf and will roll off, taking away all dirt off that leaf with it. So what if we can design a system that can alternate between being like a cactus and allowing all the water to go through and being like a lotus leaf and self-clean? Can we do that? Yeah, we can do that. Uh, because we can use our imagination, we can look for materials, we can look to make filters out of materials that if we use a trigger, they can change their properties from loving water to hating water to loving water to hating water to loving water to hating water and keep cycling that over a very long period of time. And we do this using temperature. So we decrease the temperature, it loves water. We increase the temperature, it hates water. And we keep doing this increase and decrease of temperature. And we can do this increase and decrease of temperature using radio frequency waves, using nanoparticles, magnetic nanoparticles. We put in this filter with, that's made of this material that can respond to temperature. We put magnetic nanoparticles that as we put this radio frequency, this RF heating, these magnetic nanoparticles will start to vibrate like crazy and we increase the temperature to activate a cycle. So we are using the inspiration that all that we have to us, and what you see on the right is at room temperature, a nice puffy filter. And then at high temperature, it just is the exact same one, it just shrivels up upon itself, and, does, and it releases all of the water that was inside. And so this is the cycle that we can continuously activate. So now we made a self-cleaning filter. In our journey to the perfect filter, our next step is to look at biology again and see if we can make the perfect efficiency filter. And so I look at everyone here, and if you are awakened with me and saying, wow, let's go, let's do this, let's make the filter. Or if you are thinking, I'm tired, it's been a long day. Your cells, they have not stopped working. They're still, regardless of how you know, if you're up, if you had all that coffee, or if you're down and, you know, a little slower, they're working. They are transporting water into your cells, right? They better be transporting water into your cells. They're transporting ions in the cells. They're also transporting water out of the cells. They're transporting wastes out of the cells. This is all happening in you right now, and you're not even thinking about it. Same is happening in bacteria. Same is happening in plants, and for years, for decades, for centuries, scientists were wondering, why does this happen? What leads to this perfect transport in and out of the cell? And then comes around 2002, 2003, a group of scientists discovered on cells a protein that's a channel protein, and they named them porins. Poor, poor, you know, we're scientists, we're just, Brilliant when it comes to naming things. Um, so they named these proteins porins, and then they went a step further and they identified the one that relates to water. They named that aquaporin because, you know, aqua, water. So again, that brilliant when it comes to naming things. And these aquaporins, they are beautiful pores in the sense that they will allow for nothing but water to go through. And how do they do that? Well, they have their channels with a certain electricity and conformation that forces the water to kind of, if my torso here is the oxygen and my arms are the hydrogen, forces water to kind of move in a certain way through it and only the water can go through and nothing else can go through. So now we're saying that in our bodies, in the bodies of all plants and animals, and hint, hint, the bodies of all bacteria, the cells of all bacteria, it's the big hint, there are these channels, there are these proteins 
that allow only water to go through and nothing else. So what if we were able to take bacteria, it's not humans, I'm not going to, you know, tell everyone, well, if you want to live in a city and drink the water, you must therefore give some samples of your cells, of your arms, you know, so that we can make filters out of it. We don't live in that world yet. Thank goodness for bacteria. We can harvest bacteria and we can extract these proteins from bacteria cells. And we already do that. We extract these proteins from bacteria cells then we take a filter, and on top of this filter, we put these proteins, these perfect 100% efficient proteins on top of it that act as perfect channels that allow only water to go through and nothing else. And we put that and we make a filter out of it. And I'm here to tell you that this is possible, that we can make this filter. Because that little picture that you see there on the bottom, that is a filter that we have made in my lab with that, with these channels, with these protein channels that allow only water and nothing but water to go through. So I'm telling you that we looked at the world around us. We looked at, the, at nature and we can make materials. We can make filters that can clean themselves. We can make filters that allow nothing but water to go through. And if we now, our next challenge is, how can we make this at a cost that we'll actually be able to implement everywhere so that no longer those 32 buses full of children are dying in the world because of diarrhea, so that no longer we have to worry about the water, about a microcystin in the water or toxins in the water, so that we no longer have to worry about can we clean, can we treat wastewater to a point that actually becomes drinkable? So that's my long view, that we're going to continue to use our imagination to treat the water and to help people have water and live a better life. Thank you.